Okay. Um, welcome everybody to the second uh, Gorman lecture um, given by by Darren uh, Asimoglu. Um, now it's 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 a great honor and and and, and pleasure to uh, have uh, Darren giving uh, this year's uh, Gorman lectures. Um, we are uh, extremely. Uh, pleased that this worked out and uh, that Darren uh, could uh, make this uh, possible. So there are many um, things to uh, say about uh, Darren uh, and Richard introduced uh, him uh, uh, yesterday. Uh, so I will not just repeat that. Um, I personally came, uh, um, came across Darren's work uh, the first time uh, in, the, uh, in, 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 in the 1990s when uh, I was uh, working on apprenticeship training uh, and uh, 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 saw his papers together with uh, 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 Pischke, uh, which uh, influenced uh, our way of thinking about apprenticeship training uh, quite, uh, quite dramatically. Uh, and I have since ever um, uh, followed up uh, on uh, Darren's research, uh, which is uh, becoming uh, ever more uh, uh, impressive. So, um, we heard yesterday's uh, lecture and uh, Darren's uh, uh, response to some questions pointing at today's lecture. So in a, in a way, this is like a, like, a, like, a, like a movie in two parts uh, where the first part uh, builds up a lot of attention so that you absolutely have to, uh, to be uh, present at the second part uh, where we will hear many answers to uh, some of the questions which were uh, raised uh, last time. Uh, today, uh, Darren will talk about new tasks, good automation, and bad automation, uh, implications for the future uh, of work. And like yesterday, uh, the talk uh, will uh, be uh, 75 minutes, and then we will have uh, some time uh, for questions uh, at the end uh, of uh, this uh, slot. So please uh, ask your questions either on Slido uh, or if you are uh, on Zoom uh, uh, on uh, the Zoom uh, chat and I will try to concentrate them uh, and uh, 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 well and 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 post them to to Darren. So Darren, the the, the floor is yours. Uh, um, uh, please, uh, please, please, please start. Thank you, Christian. And indeed, this was meant to be a movie in two parts. So welcome to the second part. And as Christian said, uh, I'm going to talk about new auto, uh, new tasks, which I already briefly mentioned yesterday, and good automation and bad automation. And uh, uh, quick recap from yesterday, I talked about a new framework based on the allocation of tasks to factors, putting a lot of emphasis on automation, the expansion of the set of tasks that can be performed by machinery and algorithms, and, uh, and highlighted both theoretically and empirically that automation leads to a decline in the labor share. But obviously, if the past had been characterized just by automation or largely by automation, given what I have told you already, we would have expected a secular decline in uh, the labor share of production value added over the last 100 or 200 years. And that's not what happened. And the reason for that, I'm going to argue, is that the process of technological change had other dimensions. And, and, and I'm going to talk about how those other dimensions have varied, what they do, and why there are actually some reasons for concern in that, uh, in that regard. In particular, I'm going to point out that there appears to be an acceleration in automation at the expense of other types of technologies. And in particular, it is at the expense of these new tasks. And these new tasks I'm going to show have actually historically played a major role. The reason why labor share has been broadly constant in the US, and again, I would like to do more in this regard in other countries as well, but on uh, today, I'm going to focus mostly in the US data, uh, is not Bomo's cost disease. It's not factor augmenting technologies, both theoretically and empirically, those actually have more limited roles, but it's, uh, I'm going to argue, is this introduction of new labor intensive tasks. But we're also going to see that there has been a dramatic slowdown at the introduction of the new labor intensive tasks. And so I'll talk about why that might be, what its implications are, 
and why other types of automation, including, uh, and then in the second part of the lecture, I'm gonna come back to much more cross-country data. We have seen more good automation in other countries than the US. Quick recap, uh, this is the framework that I uh, introduced. The uh, most important thing in this respect that I did not really exploit yesterday is this N here. This is where the new tasks are gonna come from. But other than that, it's pretty uh, familiar from yesterday. In particular, recall that a major part of the emphasis was this on this task content, which is going to determine the labor share, not through the effect of factor augmenting technologies or factor prices intermediated through the elasticity of substitution, but uh, by changing the allocation of tasks to factors. And if you remember, this is the figure, which again, I'm gonna make references to. In particular, I pointed out how labor augmenting technologies can be viewed in this figure just a shift of the cost of production of any task by labor or the capital augmenting technologies. The reason why I put a lot of emphasis on automation is because by shifting from I to I prime, automation was generating this productivity gain here, which could be small. In fact, we're gonna come back to this figure exactly to think about what I mean about both bad automation, but by also taking tasks away from labor, this is potentially making the prospects for labor worse and reducing the labor share. Finally, in this framework now, the new thing, we can include new tasks. That's the shift from N to N prime here. And the thing, of course, is that new tasks can potentially have much larger effects on productivity than automation, because automation wasn't changing the nature of the tasks, was just reducing their costs. New tasks are uh, changing the nature of production, so they may potentially be making through complementarities across tasks or the productivity of these new tasks they could have potentially bigger effects on GDP or sectoral value added. Okay. But the first thing is the effects of new tasks on labor demand. So we can again, look at wage bill. I'm gonna look at it in logs and the effects of an increase in N more new tasks added is going to be once more decomposed into a productivity effect. And now what I'm gonna call a reinstatement effect, something that works through the task content. The productivity effect is once more how much you're increasing output holding labor and capital constant, very similar, although it may work differently for new tasks as I've just pointed out. But more importantly, the reinstatement effect is the opposite of the displacement effect. While the displacement effect, remember, was taking tasks away from labor. So these tasks here were previously performed by labor and now labor is losing them. The reinstatement effect is adding tasks that can be produced by labor. So it's reinstating labor into the production process in a central manner. And that is the reason why it is not just going to increase the labor demand, but it's going to increase the labor share. So that's conceptually what we should think about the new tasks or labor intensive new tasks role. They increase productivity as well as increasing the labor share and labor demand. Now the question is, are they really important in uh, recent economic history? Uh, that's a very difficult question. And I don't have a very simple way of answering it. We can 
ex post see what the new tasks are, but their contribution in a sort of a well-identified way is difficult to establish. But what I'm going to do is now use a little bit more of the model structure that I have introduced to do a simple decomposition exercise. So to do that, now imagine that, take a multi-sector version of the economy that I have highlighted so far. So in particular, each one of many, many sectors have exactly this production structure that I have, oops, sorry, I have already pointed out. So now imagine that each sector has this production structure. Take this setup here and think that everything here has an I subscript for, sub, for, for sector. So in particular, the labor and capital augmenting terms have an I subscript, but most importantly, also new tasks and automation thresholds have an I subscript. Okay. So then I'm going to use and also, I'm not necessarily going to assume that labor markets are competitive, but I'm going to assume so wages could differ across sectors, but I'm going to assume throughout that firms are always on their labor demand curve. Okay. Then there is an exact decomposition of how aggregate wage bill, or in my case, the private sector wage bill, I'm going to leave the government sector out, how the private sector wage bill decom decomposes. This is actually a very simple equation. I didn't know this equation before I started working on it. I think it could be useful beyond what I'm doing here as well. So in a small time period, so we can use differential calculus, the change in wage bill can be written in an exact decomposition sense into four terms. The first one is an aggregate productivity effect. So all of the productivity effects from the sectoral level aggregated up. The second is what Pasquale and I call a composition effect. It is the pure impact of shifts in value added from one sector to another. So for example, agriculture declines, manufacturing increases, healthcare sector increases, all of these things would be into a composition effect. Baumol's cost disease, for example, that has various implications, including for wages, costs, et cetera, that would go into the composition effect. The composition effect, when we focus on labor demand, is perhaps unsurprisingly, when you think about it, purely a function of the labor share of the expanding sectors relative to the labor share of the contracting sectors. Hence, reiterating what I said yesterday, labor share is the critical intermediating variable for many of the things that you want to think about. So mathematically, SL here is the labor share in the aggregate economy. SIL is the labor share of sector I. And the composition effect is how the value added shares change correlated with SIL or SIL normalized by SL. So chi here is the value added shares of the sectors. So in particular, interestingly, and this is not a bad benchmark, if the contracting sectors have the same labor share as expanding sectors, even though there's a lot of structural transformation in the economy, we won't have any implications for, the, for labor demand. The third term is where all of the canonical model effects go. So in terms of, let me actually go back for a second, just to remind you, in terms of the framework, if you recall, there are these blue effects here that capture wage, rental rate of capital, 
factor augmenting technologies all intermediated through the elasticity of substitution. Well, they all go into this substitution effect. And when you sum across sectors now, rather than the value added share, you have to use the labor share or share of employment. So this little L here is share of employment. And then finally, the last term is the really new element here, is the change in task content. We change, we take the change in task content as I've defined at the sectoral level, sum it across sectors, weighted by one minus the labor share of that sector and the employment shares. Okay. So now, of course, this is exact because I'm looking at a small time period. If you look at discrete times, there is a, order issue just as in usual decompositions, but it turns out that it doesn't, the order doesn't matter. So you can think of it as an exact decomposition, even though I'm not going to use it in continuous time. Summary, I'm now going to decompose US changes in labor demand into productivity effect, composition effect, substitution effects, and changes in task content. We observe the productivity effect directly from data. We observe the composition effect directly from the data. For the substitution effect, we observe changes in employment, changes in labor share, but we don't observe what AL and AK, and, and, and we observe, sorry, and we observe, of course, uh, uh, from, from the data, not of course, but we observe from the data payments to capital and labor so we can turn them into wage rates and uh, user cost of capital. But what we don't observe are the AL and AK term at the sectoral level. No matter, that's not, doesn't turn out to be a big problem for the reason that I've pointed out yesterday, realistic estimates or most credible estimates of the elasticity of substitution between tasks is sufficiently close to one that AL and AK don't matter all that much. So whether you take upper bound or lower bound, you get similar results. And then once you make these computation at each sectoral level, <coughs> you can calculate change in task content, this term at the sectoral level, so you can then compute the whole orange term. So that's what I'm going to do. This is just a reminder of what I showed you yesterday on the left, which is changes in the labor share of these broad sectors. And then on the right, their share of GDP. So you see what I've pointed out yesterday that mining and agriculture are small sectors, construction and transport are a little bit bigger, uh, but the, big, the most of GDP is in services and manufacturing. In the 40 years following World War II, there is already significant increase in services and decline in manufacturing. And since, as you can see here, there is some gap between the labor share of manufacturing and services, one might think that there is going to be a major composi uh, composition effect. It turns out that's not actually the case because the contracting manufacturing industries had lower labor share and expanding service industries had higher labor share than the average services. So more disaggregated data tells a somewhat different story. And you end up with this picture. The wage bill, which is the gray triangles, very tightly follows the productivity. And that's essentially a definition of labor share being roughly constant, really. And if you look at the bottom, you see that the substitution effect is very, very close to zero. Not much is going on. Composition effects are really close to zero. Those are the green circles. But interestingly, the change in task content is also pretty close to zero. Now, at this point, you might say you spent all of our time yesterday going over this change in task content, and now you're showing us that it's zero. 
Well, but it's zero in the aggregate. But that aggregate masks huge changes in task content at the sectoral level. So now on this slide, under two additional assumptions, I am decomposing to change in task content into a displacement and a reinstatement effect. One is that there is no technological regress. So everything is driven by technology either remaining constant or progressing. And that at any point in time, an industry either automates or creates new tasks, it's not doing both. If it were doing both, then both the blue line and the red line, the displacement and the restatement line would be even bigger. So this is a minimal estimate in some sense. So on the left, I'm showing for the entire economy and on the right, I'm showing it just for the manufacturing sector. And what you see is that while this curve here in the middle, change in task content hovers around zero, that's because there is a lot of displacement going on a lot of sectors where the labor share falls a lot and there is fewer tasks for labor, but also there's a lot of reinstatement. And miraculously, well, we'll come back to whether it is miraculous or not, but the two counterbalance each other. The same is roughly true in manufacturing. Slightly faster displacement in manufacturing than the entire economy, but they are pretty similar. And there is quite a bit of reinstatement going on in manufacturing. New tasks or new activities, something that's increasing the labor share in some detailed manufacturing industry. Now, what happens in the last 30 years? The structural transformation is still pretty similar. Transport construction increases a little bit, mining declines and increases a little bit, but they are very small. And manufacturing now starting from a lower base of just about 20% continues its decline and services now exceed 75% or, or close to 75% of the economy. And then the left side, where I've already shown you the labor share changes. What does this imply for the decomposition? Well, now you see two interesting things. First of all, let's look at the observed wage bill. Again, the gray triangles. As opposed to the very steady increase in the wage bill in the 40 in four decades following World War II, now the wage bill increases more slowly. And from the late 1990s onwards, by the way, this is all normalized by population, but from late, late 1990 onwards, it essentially flattens. So there is no growth in the wage bill beyond population growth. So this is what, you know, it's more or less constant here. Why is that? Well, it has two causes. One is that the productivity effect slows down. So you see the productivity effect does not have that steady growth that I showed you in this picture here. See the very steady growth of the green circles. Instead, the productivity effect slows down. But also the gap between the productivity effect and the observed wage bill opens up. And it's again, not because of composition effects or substitution effects, which are around zero, but it's because there is a negative change in task content. So the task content is now in the aggregate, is shifting against labor. Why is that? If we do the same decomposition between displacement and reinstatement effects, what we see is that there is an acceleration in the displacement effect. The red curve now goes more faster negative. It grows negative about 40 to 50%, 40, about 40% 40 faster than in the 
1947-1987 period, but also the reinstatement effect slows down significantly. It's about 50% slower in its growth. So it's this combination of faster accelerated shifts against labor in tasks and slower counterbalancing shifts in favor of in other sectors. In fact, manufacturing shows an even sharper picture. The reinstatement effect almost dies off in manufacturing, very small, and in a huge displacement effect. Now, yesterday, I showed you the relationship between labor share and automation across industries as a correlation just to sort of build some more intuition about automation and labor share changes as the central nexus of how the labor market works. So now let me do the same thing with the task content. So those shifts against task against uh, labor in task contents, those orange terms at the industry level are strongly correlated with measures of automation. This is the APR, adjusted penetration of robots, share of routine tasks, share of firms using automation technologies, share of firms using other advanced technologies. All of those are predicting more negative changes in the task content or shifts in task content of production against labor. What about new tasks? Well, we don't have perfect measures of new tasks, but Pasquale and I create some, albeit pretty noisy and open to interpretation proxies. But let me show you just to generate some ideas and make this a little bit more sort of uh, related to stuff that we can think about. So here I'm showing you the changes in task contents against four measures of new tasks that we constructed. These two on the top use various measures of new job titles or new tasks that other people have coded. On the left, this is from the uh, uh, Dictionary of Occupational Titles, and this one is from the ONET. Both of those data sets give you, uh, on the, uh, the, the DOT gives you new job titles and ONET itself uh, codes and set of skills or tasks as emergent tasks. And then we look at the share of employment uh, by occupation in industries where these new tasks or emergent skills are important. Both of those are strongly correlated with positive shifts in task contents in favor of labor. And here, we look at just the occupational structure of industries. So on the left, we are looking at industries where there are new occupations, meaning occupations that did not feature in that industry before and now are growing in that industry. So the inspiration for that is, and I'll come back to that, if you look at the first half of the 20th century, a lot of new tasks are associated, for example, with clerical occupations or non-production tasks on factory floors that did not exist and helped the efficiency of manufacturing plants increase. So this is sort of trying to capture that. And here we're just simply looking at the uh, uh, just uh, occupational diversity. Is it a very diverse set of occupations being used in industry or that whether that's increasing? Again, both of those capture some positive changes in task content. I don't think that we can be sure that this is capturing new tasks, but something about the occupational structure of industries appears to be reasonably strongly correlated with what we are uh, documenting here as uh, reinstatement effects or the new the task content increasing. 
The point here that I made that I want to come back to here is that might surprise some of you is that this composition effect, uh, what color is it? Here it seems to be blue circles. <clears throat> this composition effect is tiny and isn't doing much. Many economists have an intuition that sectoral composition is important, structural transformation is important, Bomol cost disease type things like in healthcare or education is going to be the refuge of labor against technological change that might displace labor. But we find no evidence for that. But that doesn't mean that it's impossible. And there are other episodes in history where the composition effect was very important. So here we use the same decomposition for the 60 years that were at the heart of the agricultural mechanization of the United States. And you see here that if you do the same sort of uh, decomposition, now the composition effects are actually more important. And the reason for that is that during this period, the gap between the labor share of industry and the labor share of agriculture is very large. But also you have that the industry's labor share is increasing. That's some sort of indication of task content. And this is the labor share of agriculture. This is where you see the displacement effect. So during other episodes, you again see task content changes as important, but composition effects are important as well. So there's nothing that says that as a theorem, composition effects shouldn't be important, but in recent past, they have not been important. But all of these, beg the question, why on earth should the reinstatement effect exactly or close to exactly counterbalanced the displacement effects of automation in the four decades of uh, 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 in the post-war era? And why not recently? But these are questions about endogenous automation or endogenous technologies. And I'm briefly going to talk about them now. We have to have a framework for how you invest and develop automation technologies and what other technologies you could have developed instead. That's actually what Pasquale and I uh, built in an uh, in, in AER paper published a couple of years ago. I'm not going to go through that paper in great detail, but I'll do give a very, very potted summary of it. So suppose that we have a bunch of resources that are relevant for or crucial for, autom for, for innovation. Let's call them scientists. And you can allocate them in terms of my terminology here to either I or N. I is the automation threshold. N is the task, new task threshold. And the more you, you allocate of those resources to automation, you get I dot, the I threshold increases smoothly over time with some coefficient eta I, or the more you do it to new tasks, then you have some other coefficient and then N dot increases. Of course, then the resource constraint determines what SI plus SN is or how you can perhaps use, educate other people to become scientists, et cetera. Let's suppose for reasons that will become clear, two other things. First of all, suppose that the private sector or researchers don't know eta I and eta N. They have some expectations and I'm gonna devote, denote these by these expected eta i and expected eta n. And then in addition, there are taxes and subsidies on different technologies which could be differential. Then a no arbitrage condition, which is at the heart of our paper, would take this form where pi i is the net present discounted value of pre-tax profits from automation. Pi n is the net present discounted value that a firm would capture pre-tax again from 
creating a new task. And, oh, oh, sorry, this should be minus, I'm sorry, apologies. One minus tau i and one minus tau n is what you capture. Uh, I went back and forth between subsidies and taxes, that's why, sorry. And then, because you may not know exactly how successful you will be when you denote, devote the resources to, uh, to these two different lines of attack for technological progress, your expectations might matter as well. What we showed in our previous word is that the market generates a natural equilibrating force. And that's intuitive to understand because the more you automate, the lower is the labor share. So labor becomes relatively cheap, but when labor becomes cheap, that makes it more attractive to find new things for labor to do via, via innovation. So that is an equilibrating force, which may or may not be strong enough, but at least there are some reasons for expecting that the economy will not immediately turn to one of the corners where it uses only capital or only labor. There's some reasons for when that equilibrating force will be more powerful or less powerful. We can talk about that. But what I wanna talk about instead is that even when that equilibrating force is present, it's not necessarily efficient. And typically, I will argue, when there is an inefficiency, it will take the form of excessive automation. And here I list four reasons for excessive automation. The first one is straightforward. Whenever you have research related activities that are distinct, you have to take into account which one creates more spillover. If you know creating a vaccine for coronavirus creates more spillovers to other researchers or other people beyond the profits that you make, then inventing a new option pricing formula, we would be devoting not enough of our energy for the vaccine relative to option pricing. That's very well understood and I'm not gonna talk about that but you may or may not think that's important in the context of new tasks, for example, which might require more blue sky thinking. What I'm going to talk about in the next three slides are these three additional ones, which are more automation specific. This next slide, it's so simple that I'm not even gonna show you any math, but <clears throat> I found it not always the easiest thing to convince people of. But it is, in my opinion, a first order affair. If we have labor market imperfections that create a wedge between the equilibrium wage and the opportunity cost of labor, for example, because of bargaining, efficiency wages, not monopsony, by the way, monopsony doesn't work here. Non-pecuniary mobility costs. Then that creates a first order reason for excessive automation. Why is that? Well, because the social planner would like to decide employment based on labor's opportunity cost, but the market uses the wage. And then the market's incentives are transmitted to researchers so researchers take into account the wage cost savings from automation, but they are not the same as the social opportunity cost saving. So in any labor market in which there are labor market imperfections, there is a prima facie reason for potentially excessive labor innovation, excessive automation, and therefore not enough for other types of automation such as new tasks. Second, policies. So this now squarely connects to the, uh, Christian's very interesting presentation just half an hour ago. 
In a recent Brookings papers on economic activity, Pascual Restrepo, Andrea Manera, and I looked at the implications of different types of taxation for automation adoption and development decisions. And the bulk of our work went on to compute something that I thought would be easy, but took us quite a long time, marginal tax rates for different types of factors. This is the type of thing that I have not seen for other countries, but I'm sure exists and will be amazingly useful to have more uniform construction of such data. So what I'm showing here is the evolution of the effective taxes, marginal taxes averaged, for labor, software capital, equipment capital, and structures. A couple of points are worth noting. One, labor has always been taxed more in the United States than capital. Now, the public finance economists among you will say, well, good riddance, that's a good thing. Well, actually, in that paper, we go through a theory of it and explain why we think it's not, that uh, that the uh, Chamley Judd-like zero capital taxation results are not actually that useful and or actually based on features that may not be always applicable. But that's not my focus here, so let me not get into that particular tangent. But more interestingly, the advantage of capital has significantly amplified over the last 20 years. So in the 1990s, equipment and software capital were taxed somewhere between 15 and 20% as opposed to 25% labor tax. But since then, for a variety of reasons, their tax rates have come down and they're now less than or just about 5%. Those reasons are declines in the corporate taxes, more companies in the US shifting their tax status to S corporations, and most importantly, about 50% of this are depreciation allowances that have become amazingly generous. <clears throat> And again, Christian discussed those. It depends on your perspective. Certainly, depreciation allowances may be useful for reducing distortions on investment, but implicitly they may be also introducing distortions between labor and capital. Now, those distortions may not have mattered much in the 60s and the 70s, when there were a lot of technologies that were complementary to capital and labor. And any favorable treatment of capital would naturally create trickle down for labor. But when at the margin, the relevant technologies are automation technologies, but even worse, when capital taxation or capital subsidies can trigger automation at the margin, the implications are very different. And what we show in that paper, which I'm not going to go into the details now, is that <clears throat> the favorable and increasingly more favorable treatment of capital in the US could be a potent force towards more and more and potentially excessive automation. Finally, I want to talk about something that's even more from the left field, something that <clears throat> we don't typically discuss in economics, but visions, beliefs, motivations, non-pecuniary, non-profit driven approaches of researchers could be very important as well. And with AI and especially, you know, the majority of students in some of the leading places like Stanford and MIT wanting to study computer science and AI, we may have entered an era where researchers, both at the company level and scientist level, may be excessively taken by automation. 
And there are many structural reasons for that. About two out of three dollars in the world spent on AI comes from a handful of companies. Those companies have business models that are very much centered on automation. Their incentives are transmitted to universities through grants, but even more importantly, because many of the students who study computer science and AI and machine learning want actually to go and work for those companies. And we might have created an environment in which through things that are non-pecuniary, not just through profits, but through other channels, we might have started devoting more and more resources to automation-like activities. One place where you see that, and this is something I want to study more systematically, is that there, the number of AI researchers from top US universities that have an open door, revolving door policy with uh, the top, uh, the, the big tech companies has become astoundingly high. So many AI and computer scientists would go and work for Google or Amazon for a number of years or would have a joint appointment and then would come back to Carnegie Mellon or Stanford or MIT and so on. So I think all of those raise issues about how are we going to regulate the future allocation of scarce resources in the innovation domain. Now, the point that I want to make going back to this picture is that if indeed at the margin we are creating vision related tax related or other reasons related inducements to automation that would create a double whammy for labor related to this notion of so so automation i went through yesterday in particular, remember this picture. This here was the productivity gain. And if you remember the conceptual framework from yesterday, which I reviewed briefly at the beginning, if automation is not going to be a very negative event for labor, then we have to hope that that green area is large enough. But now imagine that at the margin we subsidize capital, so firms are adopting machines instead of labor, even when the pure production costs don't justify it. Or Silicon Valley is pushing a lot of algorithms for automating workers that were already doing okay. Then many firms would be acting according to the perceived labor cost that would be actual labor cost plus taxes or because of these vision things and that will generate automation all the way to i prime for example but then the red area is not a productivity gain it's a productivity loss so that's the so-so automation par excellence we're actually automating and losing productivity, not labor productivity. Labor productivity always goes up because you have fewer workers and more machines, but TFP productivity. And that of course means that it's really bad news for labor. So going back to Christian's talk and to other things, so business taxation could be bad for discouraging firms from opening businesses or invest, installing capital, those would be bad for labor. But if they level the playing field between capital and labor, that might actually help get rid of this red area. Now, what I have said so far is all about whether we are automating too much and not doing enough new tasks, taking into account, if you recall, that <clears throat> new tasks are a potent force of generating labor demand. But if you recall, my title has good automation as well. So what 
do I mean by good automation? So to answer that question, I'm actually going to take one step back. And I'm going to show you one other major trend affecting the world economy. Demographic change. Of course, I don't need to tell you there are some of the world's leading labor economists and demographers like Christian here who know, have told a lot about aging, both in terms of its public finance and other implications. But I want to just remind everybody and bring everybody to the same page. The world has been aging for a while, or at least the developed world. It's been uneven across developed countries, and it's going to continue. So here I'm showing one measure of demographic change. You can use any measure you want, but this one is particularly useful for my purposes. It's the ratio of those who are above 60, 56 to the middle age, 21 to 55. That has been growing for OECD countries and it will accelerate further. Some countries such as Germany or South Korea have already gone through enormous aging. So South Korea, for example, was one of the younger countries in the world in the 1970s. And now it's become quite a bit older than the US, for example, shown with the yellow circles. Even the developing world included, aging is going to continue. So many people are worried about this. It has implications for social security, retirement, healthcare, but it could also have major negative effects on macroeconomics. There are many theories on this, but let me just mention two of them. One is like demand side, for example, an idea of structural <clears throat> stagnation going back to uh, the famous Keynesian economist of the uh, 1930s, 40s, 50s, Alvin Hansen, uh, is that as an economy ages, we can have excess savings over desired investment, which could lead to permanently uh, uh, shortage, permanent shortage of aggregate demand and lots of macroeconomic problems. Larry Summers recently revived that idea. Robert Gordon's book that came out three years ago put a lot of emphasis on the world economy slowing down because of supply side implications of aging. And then there are all these public finance implications of aging. So with all of these compelling, logical, and much emphasized reasons for aging to be so costly, you might expect that we should have plenty of evidence that aging has been a terrible drag on economic growth. But actually, we don't have any such evidence. This is change in GDP from 1990 to 2015 for all countries for which we have data. And on the right-hand side is the change in the ratio of older workers to middle-aged workers, that's 56 plus over 55 to 21 measure. The circles are non-OECD countries, the diamonds are the OECD countries, and the red triangle is Japan, which has undergone the fastest demographic change during this period. But however you cut these data, you do not find a negative relationship where more rapid demographic change is associated with worse macroeconomic performance over the last 20 years or 30 years. Why not? Well, there could be a lot of reasons. But one possibility is that it's because of good automation. And this frames what I mean by good automation. When automation itself responds to shortages of certain types of skills and nullifies their potential negative effects, that's good automation. 
That's different from the bad automation, the so-so automation that I showed you in three slides before. So let me now empirically and theoretically make the case for good automation and why in certain countries, the very rapid introduction of various automation technologies, not just robotics, and I'll come back to that, has taken this form of good automation. Here I'm showing you the number of robots uh, over 1,000 workers for the same country groupings as I showed in two slides ago. You see that the two countries, Germany and South Korea, Japan, we don't have detailed data for Japan for <clears throat> robots, unfortunately, it starts later, uh, have been much, much faster in building up their robot stocks. In fact, they have not just been at the forefront of robot adoption, they have been at the forefront of robot production or robot innovation. Number of industrial workers or industrial robots per, uh, per thousand in the US is about nine. It's 14 in Japan, 17 in Germany and 20 in South Korea. As opposed to all other high tech areas, US is a significant lagger in terms of robot exports. And if you look at where the major producers or innovators of robots are, the great majority of them are in Japan and Germany. There is only one of the top 20 producers in the US. Now to frame this discussion a little bit more clearly, I'm going to quickly going to go through a model, but I don't wanna spend much time on the modeling details. I just wanna fix a few ideas. And the main idea I want to fix is where we expect good automation to take place and what are the skills that are in shortage that are being met by increasing demand, uh, increasing adoption and innovation of robots. So it's gonna be a task-based model again, but now with an industry structure, output is a mixture of industries and industries are going to differ with respect to <clears throat> three things. First, they're going to have different composition of production tasks and service tasks. So XI are the production tasks where you can use industrial automation machinery. And SI is support or service tasks, non-production tasks, if you want. Alpha I is the share of service tasks. Sorry, is the sale of uh, production tasks. Production tasks are going to be a Cobb Douglas aggregate of tasks. So everything that we did for tasks before now live in that production task aggregate. So in other words, if you want to think of this in the same way as before, forget about the support or service tasks for a second, this looks exactly like before. Some tasks are automated, now the threshold I call theta i, because capital I is taken for something else, and these are the production tasks. But on top of it, you now have these service tasks, these white collar guys, which are, who are wearing ties, you might have noticed. These are the blue colors. These are the tie, uh, tie wearing white colors. So the alpha I is the first difference between industries. Theta I is the second difference between industries the extent of automation varies across. And the cost of producing with machines or robots is PM. And equilibrium now <clears throat> critically depends on various things. But what I want to emphasize 
is the relative supply of people willing to work in service tasks versus production tasks. And I'm going to think of that as depending on the age composition. So obviously other things matter as well. And in the empirical work, I'll show you, we control for education. Education doesn't matter all that much. But what matters greatly, and that makes a lot of sense if you look at motion and hence studies and things like that, is that many of the production tasks, especially before robots, require quite a bit of manual dexterity and physical exertion. And they become harder and harder as workers, typically men, age. So I'm going to think of this relative supply of workers in service tasks as being determined by the age composition. And W here is the wage of middle-aged workers who can work in production tasks. And V is the work wage of older workers who will specialize in service tasks. <clears throat> An equilibrium now corresponds or can be represented as this figure. These convex curves are the ISO cost curves for GDP. What combinations of wage for middle age, wage for older, and machine prices will give you unit cost of GDP? And an equilibrium is the tangency point of a line which determines the supply of uh, one type of worker to another with this line. So this is a point of equilibrium to start with. And then aging corresponds to a steeper line production workers become scarcer, and we move to a new point of tangency. And what's distinguishing this new point of tangency, and that's the main point I want to make from this figure, is that because production workers with the dexterity manual skills necessary for blue collar jobs have become scarcer, their wages increase. So we go from here, to here. That's the effect of scarcity that I want to take into account. Robot adoption decisions depend on the scarcity. The higher is this wage, the more robots are going to be adopted. But even more importantly, and let me just <clears throat> introduce the third difference between industries. Even more importantly, this will then have the incentives transmit it to innovation. And then I assume, or Pascual and I assume, a cost function for increasing the innovation uh, automation threshold. And then the third source of heterogeneity across industries is this rho i. A high rho i means that you can easily increase the automation threshold. the cost of increasing automation is not very convex. Loosely speaking, that corresponds to plenty of opportunities for automation. So if you compare electronics, chemicals, or auto parts to construction, it's much easier to increase automation in those sectors than of construction. And construction itself is easier than agriculture. Agriculture itself is probably easier than some of the soft skill dominated service industries. Okay. Now, the key is that when you look at the incentives for innovation and automation, they're always super modular in theta i and w. And that follows from the task-based framework. In a factor augmenting world, elasticity of substitution matters when you want to look at innovation relationships, et cetera. There are the market size effect and 
price effect. But when you look at the automation margin in a task-based framework, it's always very straightforward. Why is that? Because the more expensive a factor is, the more you want to economize on it, which is what automation achieves. So changes in task content in always introduce this super modularity. <clears throat> now, an equilibrium with endogenous technology then is a fixed point where given the wage rate for the scarce factor, automation decisions take place. And then given those automation decisions, the market equilibrium, which I showed you in this picture here, gives you exactly the same wage. That fixed point always exists and can be represented something like this. And that's the last thing I'm going to, <clears throat> well, the last two things I'm going to emphasize in the theory. Now, imagine we start here with the fixed point, which gives us an equilibrium wage W. And imagine that there is demographic change say like in Germany, that would shift this curve out. It will always lead to more automation, but here is the really cool thing. When I showed you the general framework earlier on, I showed you that automation can reduce wages, but this figure shows automation can never reduce wages when it's induced automation. So in other words, this is good automation because when automation responds to skill shortages, it can never undo the direct effect of skill shortages. It will always increase wages. Corollary, it also has to be high productivity automation. What's the economic intuition? The economic intuition is that because this automation is being called forth by skill scarcity, it's being called by the price signals of that increased scarcity. It cannot take place so that those price signals completely disappear and the wage actually falls. All right, summary. Aging always increases the wage for workers engaged in production tasks. It always increases automation technologies. It always induces additional development of automation technologies. Moreover, that effect is more pronounced in sectors which have high alpha I that have more middle-aged workers, more manual tasks. And it's also more pronounced in sectors that have more opportunities for automation. Moreover, productivity effects are also more pronounced in sectors that have high ROI, more opportunities. Productivity effects don't, the alpha I comparative static doesn't hold for productivity effects for the simple reason that high alpha I also means that those sectors are particularly badly hit by aging. So now we have a range of comparative statics. So let me now go back to the cross country and cross industry data. And let's look at those comparative statics. Time is short. So let me, I'm just going to show you some uh, summary of the results. <clears throat> but before I do that, I wanna actually show a couple of things that you may not have known because I didn't know them, but they're actually pretty remarkable. I'm gonna show it for the US, but we have done it for other countries for which we have this micro data and it's very similar. And this goes to the questions that already were raised yesterday about education. Really the key thing for these tasks which are being automated is the age structure. So here, what I'm showing you is that if you look at the age composition of workers, the middle-aged workers are very strongly specialized in industries with 
are the ones that are adopting robots. Electronics, metals, plastics, chemicals, car manufacturing. So the relative, this is not retirement because I'm just looking at employed workers by age. So this is roughly constant up to about 50. And after age 50, workers work in other sectors and not in these sectors. The same is true for occupations. If you look at the employment share of occupations that are machinists, craft production, material handling, it's fairly constant up to about age 50. And then after 50, especially after 55, older workers are never to be found in those occupations. They go and work in other occupations. Again, this is not retirement. This is just for employed workers. And then let me not show you this because time is short, but Pasquale and I do exactly the same commuting zone level analysis that we did, but now by age group. And when you introduce robots, the effects on the employment and wages concentrate on middle age workers. So older workers actually are not harmed by robots. And that's precisely because they don't compete with robots. All right. Since time is short, rather than show you regressions, let me actually show you <clears throat> some figures. Everything here is robust. I'm not showing you something, anything that hasn't been <coughs> uh, sort of heavily stress tested with various subsamples, uh, pretrends, covariates, etc. So what I'm going to show you is visual versions of this regression, changing the stock of robots between 1990 and 2025 on the aging of that country. Throughout, I'll show you specifications. Here is the, again, I'm not gonna show you the table, but this is the, this is the one without any covariates. This is the one with covariates. In the figures, I'm gonna show you the one with covariates, which controls for education, detailed education, initial demographic structure, and sectoral composition. But I'm flashing this very quickly, but whether you do or not doesn't really make any difference. Here is the data for the full sample and OECD countries. The faster you age, the more robots you adopt. South Korea, as you might have expected from what I showed you is an outlier, but whether you have South Korea or not makes no difference to the relationship actually. So the faster you age, the more robots you adopt. And this explains about 50% or so of the cross country variation. It closes one third to a half of the gap between Germany and the US. If Germany had, or if US had the German demographic structure. Now, of course, aging is endogenous. There's immigration, et cetera. If you do IV using cohort sizes going back to the 1940s, the results are remarkably similar. Coefficients are very, very small. And uh, in what follows, I'll actually show you the visual representation of the IVs, but IV or OLS doesn't make any difference. Uh, I'm gonna skip this because this doesn't have a visual representation. If you look at whether robot adoption concentrate during sub periods in which demographic change happens faster, that's exactly where you find it. But let me just skip that. But instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look at the industry level variation. But before I do that, you know, yesterday I talked about automation, but then when I went to the data, I had to look at robots. That was a shortcoming because as I said, robots are the tip of the iceberg. But for the cross country data, we can actually look at other automation technologies because we have the imports of intermediates from the com, com, uh, com trade data. So first what I'm doing here is that I'm showing you if instead of using the International Federation of Robotics data, which I used yesterday and showed you just a second ago, you use imports of robots from com trade data, you get exactly the same relationship. So these are the imports of, this sample is slightly different, 
time period is slightly different. Instead of 1993, you have to go to 1996, but the relationship is remarkably similar. But then in that data, I can observe other automation technologies and even nicely, I can contrast automation technologies to non-automation technologies. So this is where these are automation technologies. These are non-automation technologies. And I'm showing you the effect of <clears throat> aging in OECD and the full sample. So dedicated machinery, numerically controlled machine, automatic welding machines, weaving and knitting machines, automating machine tools, they all increase when you age. And their manual components, manual machine tools, not numerically controlled machines, non-automated conveyors don't. Computers don't, laundry machines don't, etc. So it's really that this aging effect is widespread for industrial automation. Very much along the story of good automation for the skills shortages that industrial workers or industrial workplaces are facing. But my focus is not just on adoption, but also on development. So let me now look at two measures of development of robots. One telltale sign is exports. The other one is patents. So let me not get into the data details, but exports come from Comtrade, patents come from, of course, patent offices. So here it is, if I look at exports of robots, the more you age, not only the more robots you adopt, but the more robots you export because you're developing them. And here it is with the other automation technologies. The more you age, the more of all the automation technologies you export and none of the non-automation technologies you export. Of course, exports is an indirect measure. So let's look at patents. So this is again, the same picture with aging on the horizontal axis, but now looking at robotics patents and you see exactly the same thing. The more you age, the more robotics patents that your country generates. And here it is with various other measures of patents. Unfortunately, some of the numerically controlled machines are too small, so you can't quite do that, but you can do general dedicated machinery and all of the automation ones increase. Look at these. This includes computers, software, nanotechnology, pharmaceuticals, none of them load onto aging. You don't generate more computers or nanotechnology or pharmaceutical patents when you age, but you generate more patents in robotics when you age. All right, I am about to conclude with two more results and a concluding slide. First of all, the same relationship that I showed you across countries is true across commuting zones in the US. Controlling for other things, more rapidly aging commuting zones, adopt more robots. Again, using the robot integrators measure. And then now coming to the industry level predictions, <clears throat> Now I look at the, not just the main effect of robots, but whether robots are being adopted, especially in industries which really need these workers, feel the skill shortages and have the opportunities for automation from a technological point of view. And <clears throat> these are the interaction effects shown in blue and green. Since time is short, let me, zoom through them, but I'm happy to take questions on it. Almost all of the main effect is explained by these interaction effects, meaning that it's not just any German industry that generates the demand for robots, but it's the German industries where there was previously the most heavy use of middle-aged workers, more manual tasks, and also those that for with other sort of engineering measures have the better opportunities for automation. And the labor productivity predictions that I said also are verified. 
the green is positive, there is no effect of the blue, which is remember that for the labor productivity, only one of the interactions should have worked. Let me conclude. What I have emphasized is that there are two phases of automation. The good automation is a source of productivity growth because it's responding to skill shortages and it's a potent force combating negative effects of demographic change. And because it's high productivity, it also helps labor. Bad or so-so automation is what happens when we are doing it excessively, especially at the expense of new tasks. If the future is one of ceaseless automation and nothing else, then what I have said immediately implies that the future of work is quite dim because we're doing too much automation, not generating new tasks. This necessitates a multi-pronged approach, which I'm happy to talk about in the discussion. You need to redirect technological change towards new tasks and towards good automation and try to cut out bad automation. That requires a rejiggling of tax policy. Labor market institutions, though labor market institutions by themselves are not enough. Because if you're doing all sorts of automation and nothing else, and you just increase minimum wages, that's going to encourage even more automation. But labor market institutions as a way of encouraging more good automation is quite a potent force. The recent economic history, the post-war period, has seen both the good automation combined with lots of new tasks that have boosted labor productivity and work opportunities, but not so much over the last 20 years. So my conclusion overall is that these task level choices are major and they are our choices. They're not preordained technological trajectories that we are, they're slavishly following. We can redirect technological change. We can do good automation instead of bad automation. We can cut out bad automation. And those are all critical for which future it will be for labor. Let me stop here and take questions. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Devin. That was that was uh, amazing. Um, uh, we have a number of questions um, on the on the Slido, and I will try to summarize that a little bit. So Maria Balgova um, asks uh, about what uh, governments can actually do uh, to prevent uh, excess automation, and I think her point. Uh, relates to, you gave three reasons um, for excess automation. The first one was a wedge between equilibrium wages and social opportunity costs. Second one was um, uh, low capital uh, taxes relative to uh, labor taxes, which encourages uh, excessive automation. But then you also uh, pointed uh, out that uh, incorrect views about the prospect of uh, different technologies could actually induce excessive automation. So I think Maria Balgova's question relates to the third one. Um, the first two ones, uh, to some extent, can be, I understand, influenced uh, by government uh, action or are even induced uh, by government action. But the third one, uh, because ideas are floating around in a non uh, rivalrous uh, way, um, is there anything governments can actually uh, do about that? Uh, and I think that question is also related to what Alex uh, asks. Uh, if good automation uh, responds to, still, uh, to skill shortage, can government uh, investments in high-skilled workers inadvertently induce so-so uh, automation? Uh, so uh, both questions related to what can the role of government actually be um, to do something uh, about uh, steering the economy towards uh, what you call uh, good automation and away uh, from so-so automation? Well, those are excellent questions. Uh, I mean, let me actually first say that I think the do no harm principle is important. So I think the first thing that the government can do is actually remove a lot of the uh, <coughs> distortions that they themselves create, such as the excessively favorable treatment of capital that in our work suggests may be a contributing factor. But beyond that, if you look at the signature technologies of the last century. The internet, antibiotics, sensors, uh, <clears throat> advanced machines, 
they all have the fingerprints of the government all over them. The government was involved in the design stage through various agencies and was a major purchaser of these technologies. Antibiotics or anti-malarial drugs would not have existed without the Department of Defense's concerted effort during World War II, for example. But if you look at the last 30 years in the US, and again, it's a little different across countries, but in the US, the government has not only just cut funding, especially for blue sky research, but has also left the leadership to Silicon Valley. So when the NSF wants to decide what to invest in in science, it goes to the executives of Google, Netflix, Amazon, and Microsoft to ask them what we should do, both in our defense spending and in our technology policy. So again, these are some brilliant people, but I think there's a vision issue here. And that's where I would put a broader discussion. And as economists, we're not, you know, we're not always uh, so fluent in thinking about these vision issues, but I have come to believe that they are important. So at least we should investigate. And if we do find them to be important, see whether we can do more quantitatively trying to understand and regulate these vision related issues. And in terms of the skills, I think uh, that's a very interesting question, Alex. One possibility is that it's actually the imbalance of skills that's important. It's not just that we have a lot of very, very skilled engineers, that's pretty useful. But the next layer of workers is actually not sufficiently skilled to be able to work with many of the new tasks. So in another paper that Pasquale and I wrote, what we find is that the reinstatement effect in the five decades following World War II was strongly correlated with demand for unskilled workers at the industry level. But that correlation reverses in the last two decades. So that even the industries that have, do, that have been doing these new tasks, they're not demanding unskilled workers. And part of that may be because they are deeming these unskilled workers not sufficiently skilled to work with the new tasks and the new activities. And if that's the case, then we have a triple whammy for these low skill workers. Okay, thanks, uh, um, Darren. There are three, well, there was one question on, um, on a slide of which I will uh, uh, briefly uh, phrase, and then Richard and Imran have a question. So I suggest uh, to make this a little bit more exciting, Imran and Richard, perhaps you can just ask your questions uh, yourself, and then Darren uh, gives the last, a last round of uh, responses. Uh, so Rachel asks, and that kind of follows up from Alex's question, uh, what the impact of uh, encouraging uh, something what we are doing now in, in, in industrialized countries, encouraging older workers to work longer, uh, basically should have for inducing so so automation uh, relative to good automation. Uh, and then Richard and Imran, maybe you just uh, ask your questions. Uh, you are both on Zoom, so ask your questions uh, yourself, and then uh, Darren can uh, perhaps make a last round of uh, of, 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 of responses. Shall I go? Yeah, Darren, yes. fantastic lecture. I've only, some of the points I was going to raise have already, questions have come up, but um, the way you pitched it as you were going is, is kind of quite exciting in, in the following sense, um, that you know, there's the debate between kind of picking winners and um, kind of getting incentives right. And uh, it's, it's a kind of important one and we tend to go one or the other. Uh, so I, I think my question is really, I, how important is the getting incentives right relative to the others? It's almost like across your three, uh, it just take what you've learned from the US because um, it, for a long time at IFS, we've been pushing for the, uh, for the same effective marginal tax rate on capital and labor, for example. And uh, this is just another way of arguing why it's so important. It's, it's, a, key, it's a key one. And I think that's, that's, um, that's, that's very important. So uh, one question is, uh, given what you've shown us, how, to what extent, how much does that 
go to fix things or what's your general view there versus the other the other is um the kind of role of the government in complementary activities kind of in both education r d and those kind of things that's in between uh perhaps what it used to do but it's um of course can be directed so i don't think i'll say much more than that um but those two that you know getting some a little bit more uh definition and a bit more uh, a bit more uh, of the actual um, you know numbers behind how you think these are, are going to balance but thanks it was fantastic thank you thank you Richard. and Iman they're on those amazing um, I, I just wanted to ask to get your thoughts and sort of two sort of um, sort of modeling aspects that, that you've been discussing in the last two lectures the, the, the first is I mean can You've been talking about um, tasks, but would you see there's a, a distinction between tasks and jobs? That jobs are a collection of tasks, and especially to understand the distributional implications of automation, especially for those workers in the middle of the skills distribution whose jobs may be combining on the automation versus the new task margin. And, and the second issue was, do you think that we should think of automation as fundamentally different to how we typically model R&D? where R&D is essentially, you know, firms adapting technologies for their own purpose. That, that's one element, but really coming back to the, the vision and perhaps the peculiar sort of market structures and selection of individuals into the sort of original industries that are producing these technologies without possibly knowing how those technologies are going to be used. Is, 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 does that make this, to, to model this somewhat different than how we might think of the R&D, which focuses on that second stage of adapting technologies that have been invented within firms. Thank you for all of the excellent questions. On, uh, on Rachel's question, I think that's a very interesting issue. It creates a number of additional effects. If we increase the supply of uh, older workers, that will increase the scarcity of middle-aged workers and might push the W up and that might induce more good automation, but it might also fill a lot of the jobs that could be restructured with older workers, which don't have the more recent human capital. So it might have other implications along the lines of Alex's questions about skills. So that's very, uh, there, there are a bunch of issues. And I think that's a very, very interesting area to investigate. In terms of Richard questions, I mean, I would, it would take me about an hour to answer all of the issues that Richard raised and perhaps some of it we can, I'll follow up with Richard. But, you know, if the labor market is one in which firms are on their labor demand curves and none of the vision and other issues that I have talked about exist, then once you get the optimal tax on capital and labor, then the automation innovation and automation production decisions are optimal. So if you get the optimal taxes, then you don't need to interfere with automation. Exactly. And then in the paper that I mentioned, the Brookings paper, we actually compute what the optimal tax would be. And miraculously, it turns out to be very close to the IFS, you know, the equal tax, very close to equal taxation of capital and labor. And I'm happy to talk about why that comes up and we can, we can talk about. But, but yes, I think uh, <clears throat> we have for too long gone down the path of supporting low income, low, low taxes on capital income. And that I think has a bunch of implications. And I think the public finance of it is super interesting. And thanks Imran for those issues. And then, well, let me, I mean, I don't want to take much longer, but let me say, I, 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 I think, I really hope one thing that people will remember from this is that not all technologies and therefore not all R&D are created equal. So R&D is just an effort to develop different types of technology. And I think it will be very different when depending on whether it's directed towards improving machine tools, improving computers or improving automation or improving new tasks. So, you know, the most common question I have gotten over the last 10 years, if I integrate all of the questions is, whenever I talk of automation or robots, I get, well, why are robots different than capital stock? And, and I hope I have, planted the idea that they are very different from capital stock because capital stock itself is an amalgam and anything that we do for R&D is an amalgam of many, many, many different technologies. And these technologies have very different effects. Even the same technology might have very different effects as my emphasis of good automation versus bad automation emphasizes. It depends how much productivity effect it generates and which tasks it replaces. But you're absolutely right. Once we go deeper, the task 
structure of occupations really matters. For example, ATMs did not lead to the demise of tellers for two decades because tellers were doing a whole range of tasks different from ATMs. The tellers have this started this, this, this disappearing over the last 10 years in the US because now other algorithmic automation has taken away many of the other tasks that tellers used to do. So the occupational structure is very important. And another important area, which again, I think is fantastic area for people to do work, especially if they have access to interesting microdata, is restructuring the task structure of occupations. So new technologies also <clears throat> enable you to remake occupations that, you know, if you think of what a professor does today, just to uh, put the spotlight on ourselves, relative to what, you know, uh, people used to do in the 1950s is completely different. And that's the task content of the professorial academic occupation changing. I think those are really interesting questions to investigate. Thank you, Imran. Okay, Darren, thank you very much for a truly fascinating set of uh, lectures. I think if uh, Terence uh, Gorman could uh, be sitting here, he would be absolutely pleased uh, about uh, uh, this event, not just uh, the lectures, but also uh, the, the, the conference itself. And, and I think we, we are all grateful, uh, Darren, for your, your participation in, in, in all the talks uh, and uh, uh, the inter interaction we had. I think this was uh, a, great, uh, a great set of, of lectures and a great uh, a conference. Um, now, uh, before, before we all go, uh, I think we, 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 should, we should all uh, thank uh, a person who has always been in the background uh, and uh, has worked very hard uh, on making uh, this event uh, possible. And that is, uh, that is Maria. Uh, Maria, without uh, your support and your help, uh, I think we wouldn't be, um, we wouldn't be, be, be having, uh, we wouldn't have had this, uh, this successful conference. Thanks a lot uh, to uh, Maria. Thanks a lot, Darren, again. Uh, uh, and thanks uh, to, to everybody for, for this fantastic event. Thanks. Great.